It's now the 23rd of January, 1983. Anti-apartheid activists are launching the United Democratic Front, commonly known as the UDF. Led by prominent anti-apartheid activist Alan Busak, this is a grouping comprised of churches, civic associations, trade unions and student organizations. Its establishment is necessitated by the void left by the ANC and PAC who were banned by the government 20 years earlier from participating in any form of political activity. Also, Ingata was no longer considered the ally of the struggle. And during their launch, they stated that they welcome all organizations uh, yeah, and the, against apartheid, but they said, but except in God. With Mangosutu Butelezi now outside the liberation movement, the UDF takes the anti-apartheid struggle forward without him. On the ground, it's mayhem. The 1980s were arguably the ugliest years in the history of South Africa. Um, because that's when now the revolution was in full force. There was the 1980 school boycott. And that's when COSAS and organizations like those were formed. And then the trade unions were getting stronger. Civic organizations were starting to form again in the, in the 80s. And our fondest wish is that we should create in South Africa a society in which white or black has no significance. The insurgency is further bolstered by ANC President today, Oliver Tambo, whose South movement African, is headquartered like, in exile. We are all Africans. He uses the party's January 8th statement in 1985 to call on South Africans to render the country ungovernable. We are not a third-rate little republic. We face adversity from a position of strength. South Africa's Prime Minister, P.W. Boerter, responds to the political dissent by declaring a state of emergency. What a state of emergency does, it allows government to exercise certain powers that ordinarily it wouldn't satisfy. At the case, it was arresting people, I mean, for a number of days or even months without sometimes charging them telling them what they are being arrested for. It wanted to clamp down on the political rebellion that was basically just erupting throughout, throughout South Africa. But the clampdown doesn't stop the insurgency. If anything, violence spreads to the rest of the country, prompting the government to extend the state of emergency to 1986. People lose their lives. Activists are arrested. Journalists are barred from covering the unrest. South Africa is burning. So the struggle is on steroids, steroids now. And the apartheid government finds a very reliable and trusted ally in Mangosutu Butelezi and the Ngata Freedom Party, then known as Ngata, in trying to crush this revolution that's happening, this uprising that's happening. What Butelezi and Nikata were able to do was to provide ground forces for the apartheid government. The police could come and shoot, and the police could come and arrest people, and the army would be brought in to, to, to assist. But in the IFP, what they could do is get militias who could just simply go into townships, burn people's houses, kill people, go onto trains, murder people, and make sure that activists, that the lives of activists are not comfortable, that the lives of activists are not safe. But then you get evidence as time goes by of training camps in parts of KwaZulu-Natal, and it appears that some of these training camps are actually being resourced by the Nationalist Party. I mean, there are questions about why would they be so armed to the teeth to the point of being able to 
go around some communities and terrorizing some communities, where would they have gotten that um, force and power behind them for all the types of equipment, the guns and so on that they had? Everybody says IFP killed people. Who killed the IFP people? Why are we not answering that question? We've got scarred families today who have lost family members, who have lost fathers, mothers, and sisters. I'm deployed to the south coast of Oslo Natal. And the horrific stories of death of IFP people, young people. But there's a complex layer to this conflict. It appears to be accompanied by tribal undertones. It's Amazu clashing with Amakosa or anyone affiliated or sympathetic to the liberation struggle. The very formation of the IFP was predicated on Zulu nationalism. It would, by virtue of its existence, mobilize Abandu Babazud. And that is why, if you look at the presence, geographical presence of the IFP, if it is not dominant in KwaZulu Natal, it is dominant in areas outside KwaZulu Natal where there is a concentration of Zulu people in hostels, in mines. That's where you'd probably find a concentration of the IFP outside of KwaZulu Natal. So all, all that chaos, all that violence was geared towards an arrangement, a, a, an ultimate political settlement that would maintain Wise and Gacha in some positions of authority. That was not a Zulu cause of violence. It was a state-sponsored violence using IFP MPs with Gachap Telezi, our own Jonas Savimbi, leading that violence. Um, so, so the idea of ethnic conflict, nah, nah, it was all nonsense. It was all nonsense. Bullshit, actually. Um, completely fabricated. And that is why I don't understand why, why, why Gachap Telezi today is celebrated as a some kind of a hero, because he's not.